and welcome back to another lecture of Statistics 479 Time Series Analysis. We've started our final section on spectral methods for time series. What we're going to do today is look at the spectral density and the spectral distribution. have an idea, right? I mean, I'm assuming you know what the probability density function and the probability distribution functions are, or the cumulative distribution function to be precise. Well, what we're going to be doing today is we'll be looking at the spectral versions of both of those objects. So what are the spectral versions of those objects? Well, they correspond to what frequencies are most prominent in our time series data. So if we have, say, some time series data that we're looking at, and we want to know what the most prominent frequencies are, we can look at the spectral density, if it exists, which we'll talk about in today's lecture, um, and we'll try to figure out exactly what's going on, what are the strongest frequencies in our data, and you know what? It's all related to the autocovariance function, our dear friend, and we'll find out how it all fits together in today's lecture. So, let's get into the notes. And welcome back to another lecture of Statistics 479 Time Series Analysis. Today we will continue our discussion of time series in the spectral domain. Last time we looked at the periodic process. The idea was to write out the process in terms of sine and cosine functions, and then to look at the coefficients that go in front of them. If the squared sum of the coefficients is big, that indicates that the corresponding frequency is prominent in the time series. So it's sort of like a strong uh, frequency in the signal that we have. Now today, we're going to go a little bit further and we're going to look at something called the spectral de distribution and the spectral density. So these, the terminology here is very deliberate. Right? We know what a distribution function and a density function, right? A CDF and a PDF. The cumulative distribution function for a random variable and the uh, probability density function for a random variable. Well, today we're going to look at the spectral density and the spectral distribution. And it turns out that these things are really closely related to the auto covariance because like I said this whole course it's really just auto covariance all the way down um, at the end of the day whatever we're doing somewhere somehow the auto covariance is behind it right so what are these spectral densities and spectral distributions well let's jump into the notes and find out all right well the first thing we're gonna have to do is write down a couple theorems it's always a good day when you get a good theorem in a class and uh, these ones are quite nice. So what we're going to consider are called the wiener kinchin theorems, and there's two of them. Wiener and uh, Kinchin were both two fairly bright uh, mathematicians, probabilists, and whatnot back, um, I don't know, probably about 100 years ago now. Um, though it's interesting, I don't know the history of this theorem, but I'm pretty sure that Wiener was, I want to say, American, uh, and Kinchin was, uh, well, not. I think he was Russian, I want to say. Uh, so there's a good chance that this is, theorem is named this way, not because they work together, but because they, uh, well, came up with the same idea independently. Though I honestly don't know the history of this theorem, and now I feel bad for um, speculating on the origin of both Wiener and Kinchin when I'm actually recording this. I should have actually read it beforehand rather than just speaking extemporaneously. But maybe at the end of the lecture, we'll revisit this and figure out who these two guys actually are. But for now, we need their theorem. So first of all, this is the section on spectral density and distribution. And what we'll start with is the first of the two wiener kinchin actually i'll write it that way wiener kinchin theorems if you've studied uh, stochastic processes you've probably heard of the wiener process which is uh, just a renaming of brownian motion i'm pretty sure brown or was uh i think he was british if i recall so uh, they both got their names associated with that process. Anyway, this is Wiener-Kinchin 
theorem one. And what it says is that let xt be stationary, always a good start, stationary with auto covariance k x h defined as usual, which is just the covariance between x t plus h and x t. So nothing new there, but just writing it down to be explicit. Um, then there exists a unique monotonically increasing function, monotonically increasing function, which we will denote as f, capital F, x of omega. And this is called the spectral, let's change the color to uh, emphasize it, the spectral distribution. Of course, I haven't told you what the spectral distribution does yet. That's the conclusion of the theorem. And the spectral distribution is such that f of x at the value of minus one half is going to be zero. So it starts at zero at minus a half. At plus one half, it takes on the value of k x zero, which again is just the variance of the process at any time because it's stationary, the variance is the same no matter what t is. And I guess most interestingly is what happens between minus one half and plus one half. Well, it turns out that we can define the spectral, or not the spectral, the auto covariance function at lag h to be the integral from minus one half to one half of e to the two pi i complex exponential omega h. And this is integrated with respect to d f x omega, right? So this, basically this is a Riemann Stilches, Stilches, I think it is, yeah. Stilches, <laughs> integral. Now that I think about it, of course we know who Bernard Riemann is. I'm not sure who uh, Stilches is. I have to look that one up too. So many different names, right? Got to keep track of them all. Regardless, um, hopefully you've seen the Riemann Stilches integral. It's just basically saying instead of integrating with respect to like dx, I have, or d omega, I have df x omega. But if you took a course, in distributions and probability theory, this should look familiar, right? Because this is very similar to the idea of integrating with respect to a random variable, right? So here, f is looking a lot like a CDF function, a distribution function, but it's a little bit different. Recall in contrast, a c d f f. <laughs> of x, say, um, is increasing from 0 to 1. So it has a similar connotation, but it is a different object here. It's still an increasing function, but it goes from 0 to the variance. Um, I guess if you normalized it by the variance, then it would look more like a, uh, a proper CDF. But uh, we're not doing that right now. So this is basically saying that there exists a function called the spectral distribution such that when I integrate, do this complex integration over all frequencies from minus one half to plus one half, remember omega is thought of as a frequency, what we get out is the auto covariance. So on its own, that's maybe not the most interesting thing because uh, we know what the auto covariance is, 
but I don't really know what this F is, right? This spectral de or spectral distribution is a little bit more arcane. Um, so we can actually get something better out of this if we look at the second wiener kinchin theorem. But first, uh, maybe I'll just write down explicitly, though so actually I'll make a little bit of room here from this blue box. And I'll extend my uh, parentheses here. <laughs> I.e., um, right, this integral, well, when I say d f x omega, what I kind of mean is this is equivalent to um, f, where is it, little f x omega d omega. Um, but this is if, um, yeah, this is basically if, uh, if fx is differentiable. Right, so if I can take the derivative and it exists, then there's a little f, and I can write the integral in terms of a integral we're more familiar with, just the Riemann integral, um, rather than the riemann stelches integral. But um, ah, even if I uh, can't do that, um, I can still write down the riemann stelches integral in terms of the distribution function. Right. Oh, that's right, yeah. If the auto covariance is absolutely summable, oh yeah, there's a couple, that's right. So we have to talk about strengthening this. Strengthening the above, which is basically if the auto covariance kx h is absolutely summable. I got to make sure I get all my conditions right here because right if we're doing proper theorems everything has to be just right terminology. So we need this to be absolute the summable, um, then the spectral density, or spectral, sorry, distribution, the spectral distribution being fx at frequency omega is absolutely continuous, is abs continuous. Right, and then, continuing our cycle of then, then if it's absolutely continuous, uh, the derivative exists almost everywhere, then fx omega, which is the derivative of fx omega exists almost everywhere, AE, um, and is called the spectral density. All right. So yeah, basically our auto covariance is going to be absolutely summable. I'm pretty sure we did that in an assignment question, if I recall. I'd have to double check that. Um, I mean, if you had a really dumb auto covariance, like it's all one all the time, well, that's no good. Um, but if you have the auto covariance is much like the ones we've seen in class, things that, well, for the moving average process, the auto covariance just goes to zero after a finite number of lags. So that's definitely summable. Um, in the auto regressive case, we have that geometric decay in the auto covariance. So that's definitely going to be summable as well. Again, assuming that these processes are nice the way we expect them to be. If we have, when I say auto, I guess auto regressive, I'm thinking that it has to be an auto regressive that's causal so that it doesn't blow up, right? So there are cases where this will fail, but most of the cases that we would study in this class are going to work with this fall into this setting. And if we fall into this setting, we get a spectral density. And if we get a spectral density, we get uh, another theorem. And that's going to be the uh, Wiener Kinchin Kinchin. Kinchin's inequality is actually one of my favorites. So uh, 
I like Kinchin, even though I know nothing about the person, man, except that he uh, has his name associated with some pretty cool results in mathematics. So this is Wiener Kinchin theorem part two. And what it says is once again, we have to let XT be stationary as always. And auto covariant. Okay, I don't need to write it again. With KXH, the auto covariance, such that the auto covariance is absolutely summable, which means that if I sum H from minus infinity to plus infinity of the absolute value of KX lag H, and have that, that has to be finite, right? This is the auto covariance being absolutely summable. So if that's true, then we can write what? We can write the auto covariance. Oh yeah, this is just the, this is not the most, this isn't the best part yet. The best part's to come. This is just what I already set up above. We can write the auto covariance in terms of a classic Riemann integral, which is going to look something like e2 pi i omega h f x omega little f, by the way, dw, where little f of x is what we already said it is, is the spectral density function. But more interestingly, is the inverse transform, because like I said, I don't know what the spectral distribution is or the spectral density off the top of my head, but I know what the auto covariance is. We know what that is because we've calculated it basically in every section of this course. And so then we get, so this is the then, the next thing is a furthermore, we have the inverse transform transform the transform being the fact that up above we're turning the spectral density into the spectral distribution um, in this case we have the inverse transform where we're going to turn what did i say we're turning the spectral density into the auto covariance is what i meant to say up above now we're going to turn the auto covariance into the spectral density and the inverse transform is going to look like f of x omega is going to be the sum h from minus infinity to plus infinity. And that's going to be k x h e to the now minus minus 2 pi i omega h. Because again, auto covariance is a uh, discrete valued in this sense. I mean, again, you could have, you could talk about continuous time stochastic processes where the auto covariance can take on any argument, but here we're doing discrete time. So H is going to be an integer. So we're going to sum over all H rather than doing some type of integral. Oh, and this is four omega in the closed interval minus one half to one half. Cool. All right, so what can this tell us about the spectral density, right? Because I have this idea in my head that it's going to be a lot like a probability density, but don't quite know what's going on yet. In this case, it's contained on an interval, a closed compact interval here between minus one half and plus one half. So, well, let's see what we can get out of this. So let's see. Let's call this the uh, spectral density. And what can we learn about the spectral density? Well, first of all, it is even. Okay, um, why? Well, it's even because, I mean, well, first of all, what does that mean? That means that F X, wait, yeah, X minus omega is going to equal to F x plus omega and that's because well why should that be true this is 
true because e dot 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 if we consider the exponential of 2 pi i omega h then what is this thing going to be well this thing is going to be the cosine of 2 pi omega h my or er, plus do I want a minus sign in there? Well, we'll just do it this way. Plus i sine 2 pi i omega h. And then you're thinking, well, wait a minute. Um, what's going on here? Right, because if I consider the negation of that, I get a negative 2 pi i omega h. And that's not the same thing. That's cosine 2 pi omega h minus i sine 2 pi i omega h. But both of these appear in the sum above. So this guy and this guy are both in the sum from minus infinity to infinity. So basically what happens is, is that if I plug switch omega with minus omega, I go up to this summation here and I sum it backwards basically. Uh, and by symmetry of auto covariance, this works. Um, I mean, effectively, right? We could even write this out maybe more properly in the sense that if I have an F X minus omega, then that's going to be the sum h from minus infinity to infinity of k x h e to the plus. Actually, how do I want to write this? We'll start off writing it the correct way or the, the simplest way, which is 2 pi i omega h. But then what we do is we note that this is the same summation minus infinity to plus infinity of how do I want to write this? We can sub. I'm going to substitute in. Um, basically, I want to switch h for minus h, so I can switch this to minus h because by symmetry nothing has changed. And two pi minus two pi i omega minus h. Right, and what we end up doing is we end up basically summing all of the same terms, but we're instead we're running h backwards. So we can replace h with what comes after h? J. I don't really want to use. Well, you can. We can. How about r? R feels like a good lag variable. So what we're effectively doing is running r from infinity to minus infinity of k x, not sum of k x r e to the minus 2 pi i omega r, which because summation is commutative, even when I'm summing to infinity, yeah, uh, we end up with just the auto or the um, spectral density at omega. Cool. So now we have two things that we know. We know that the spectral density exists only on a finite interval from minus one half to one half, to plus one half and it's symmetric about the point zero because it's an even function so what else can we get out of this well consider the fact that the variance of xt is equal to what it's equal to kx at lag zero and if we go back up to that summation that just fell off the top of the page what we're saying is that oh wait i want to do this slightly backwards not the summation i want that integral what that means is that if i plug in a zero here then my e to the two pi i omega zero just vanishes it becomes a one and what we find out is that we can write the variant of a process as the integral from minus one half to one half of just the spectral density integrated over, I guess, with respect to omega. So what does that mean? Well, that means that we can think of the variance as an integral, a summation in some sense, of all of the different 
frequencies. So this is the variance as a, I'll say sum of all the different frequencies Well, the sum of all the different frequency intensities, I should say. Because I say sum because we're actually integrating, so it's kind of like a sum, right? That's the whole point of the integral, but it's it's a little different. Um, what we're saying here is that the variance is we're taking the spectral density, which is kind of like the intensity of the uh, of a of given frequencies in our data in our time series xt and we're integrating over the whole thing so we're kind of like adding up all of the intensities of the different frequencies and that's kind of interesting because this is this is a lot like the ANOVA decomposition That is that the total sum of squares can be written as, you know, other sums of squares like a treatment sum of squares plus a residual sum of squares. Or if you take a course like my design and analysis of experiments course, you'll see that, yeah, you can get lots more different treatments and block sum of squares and other sums of squares in there. but. Ultimately, it's a similar intuition. It's telling us that in the ANOVA case, we can take our total sum of squares, the total amount of variation in our data, and we can break it into pieces corresponding to different factors in our model. In time series world, we're taking the total variation or the total variance in our signal, and we're breaking it into the contribution from each of the discrete well, each of the frequencies, in this case, continuous, um, in practice, discrete, because we're sampling discreetly, but we'll get into that. Um, anyway, yeah, we can actually do a simple example to see what actually comes out and what a spectral density would look like. So let's do that. All right, so for a simple example, let's consider the periodic process that we talked about in the last lecture. So what we have is, let's say, example, So let's consider xt is going to be what? Well, it's going to be u1 times the cosine of 2 pi omega naught t. 2 pi omega naught t for some frequency omega naught. And then we're going to have u2. And that's going to be times the sine of 2 pi omega naught t. All right, so that's our simple, simple periodic process. It's just a cosine wave and a sine wave. Here, u1 and u2 are uncorrelated random mean zero, uncorrelated random variables. Then we can say then <coughs> the auto covariance is what? It's going to be kx lag h. And that's going to be, well, we already did that in the last lecture. That's just going to be sigma squared times the cosine of 2 pi omega naught h. So we did that. Um, but it turns out that, right, we can write the cosine in terms of two exponentials. This is, uh... nope, never mind. This is uh, something different. I was getting confused with hyperbolic functions there for a second. Um, here, what we would have is something that looks like e to the, yeah, I think I forgot the i in there, 2 pi i omega naught h. And then I have to add to it e to the 2 pi i, or sorry, minus 2 pi i omega naught h. Right, because effectively when I have a complex exponential, it's going to give me a cosine, which is going to always be positive. And then one of these is going to have a plus sign. One's going to have a minus sign. They're going to cancel out with each other. 
and we'll be left with just two times the cosine. The two cancels out with the two in the denominator, and we are good to go. And it turns out that this thing is the integral from minus one half to one half of e to the two pi i omega h. I guess we can write it as df. Actually, we should write it this way because I don't know if this is going to be a differentiable. It's going to be two spikes, basically. Well, I guess it is in a sense. It's going to be flat and just, yeah, it's not going to be the most interesting thing. So basically, the idea is that we can write it in this form where fx, the spectral density function, not at h, but at omega, is going to be what? Well, it's going to be zero for omega less than omega naught. Then it's going to be... Um, well, it's going to actually what I should do is I should write this as a uh, let me write this a little bit better. We're going to write this in three pieces at once. This thing is going to equal three things. It's going to equal zero. This is omega less than omega naught. It's going to equal, well, half the uh, variance, I guess, sigma squared over two for omega in the interval from minus omega naught to plus omega. I should double check to make sure that's a closed inter interval. Um, and then it's going to be sigma squared for omega greater than omega naught. So should that be a closed interval or not? Well, what we should have is a function that has those two spikes at minus omega naught and plus omega naught. That makes sense. And yeah, see, my intuition is telling me that it should be a half open interval. But when I wrote it a year ago, I had it as a closed. I want to say this is probably what I want, because that's typically the way that I would think of a step function like this. All right, so if we draw this out, what we're going to get, let's see. So we're going to have our minus one half, our plus one half. Somewhere in here, we're going to have the magic frequency omega naught, negative and omega naught. And what our function is going to look like, right, is it's going to be zero. Well, I guess we need two more points. We need our sigma squared and our sigma squared divided by two. So what we do is we basically have zero, and then that's open here, and then that just jumps right up to uh, one, or not one, to sigma squared over two, and then that jumps up to uh, sigma squared, and that ends right here. All right, so that's our spectral distribution function. Not the most exciting one, but it's a good example of what we can get. Yeah, as I noted in my notes, the auto covariance is not absolutely summable in this case. So there is no spectral density, right? Because we'd have these like giant infinite spikes in some sense. I mean, if you just imagine trying to take the derivative of this red line, it's not going to work so well. Uh, but what we can note is that, note that the sum of k, x, h for h from minus infinity to plus infinity, well, what's that going to be? Well, that's going to equal sigma squared, which has to be positive, and then it's going to be the sum, well, the same sum over h, which I'm not going to write again, there's the absolute value of the cosine of 2 pi omega naught h. And that thing will constantly keep fluctuating up. So in this case, we have a process which will have, 
I, I want to say long range, but almost like infinite range dependency in the sense that if uh, if it just so happens that, uh, well, I guess it can happen for any H, but um, the problem is it depends on what omega is. If omega is an integer, then it's super easy to show. So if omega, or not an integer, but a, is equal to something like 1 over n, for n being an integer, looks like an h, then write the cosine of 2 pi h over n is going to equal, h over n looks terrible because there, I, there we go, h over n in absolute value is going to be equal 1 for all h equal to, I guess, well, 0 plus or minus n plus or minus 2n. Um, actually, we could even do n over 2, right? Because the cosine of pi, the cosine of 0 is, is 1. The cosine of pi should be minus 1. So the point is we get a lot of 1s. And if we sum up an infinite number of ones, we get infinity, and thus this thing diverges. It does not absolutely summable. Now, if omega is not an integer, you can kind of come up with the same argument. It just isn't as uh, easy to, it's not as like obvious to see. Right, basically, I don't want to sum up one to infinity. It's not going to sum up. Uh, so in this case, yeah, we don't have absolutely summable auto covariance, therefore no f of x omega, even though I'm pretty sure there's a way you can kind of hand wavely define it by having, I think, two delta functions at minus omega naught and plus omega naught, but we're dealing in this realm right now, so we're not going to worry about that. <laughs> right, I think this is Riemann-Stelch's versus Lebesgue integral, but um, yeah, I'm going to have to brush up on my uh, real analysis to make sure I'm getting all that right. Let's do another example. Example two, which is white noise. Our favorite little WT process. So what is white noise? Well, white noise has an auto covariance um, right here, we already know what the auto covariance is. This was, I think, lecture one of the course. Well, I didn't define auto covariance, I think, in lecture one, maybe lecture two. Regardless, the idea is that white noise is going to have a variance of sigma squared. This is h is zero, and it is uncorrelated for all other values of h. So it's zero everywhere else. What can we learn about the spectral density then? Well, first of all, um, this is absolutely summable because just about every value in it is zero except for one, which is sigma squared. So that's great. That's uh, absolutely summable. We can do that. and. What that means is that we can actually write, well, what does that mean? That means another therefore um, is that the spectral density function is going to be what? Well, it's going to be the sum h from minus infinity to infinity of x, kx, h, e to the minus 2 pi i omega h, but only one of them is not going to be 0. That's when h is equal to 0, which is going to be sigma squared. Therefore, a lot of therefores here in a row. Um, this is just sigma squared. So our spectral density is going to be even less exciting than the last one. If we have our minus 1 half and our plus one half, and we have some value sigma squared in here, then our spectral density is going to look, we'll do it in red, like this. Right across. 
I was supposed to go through the black line, but I didn't. So we'll move the black line and delete my other line in the process. Good start here. Yeah, there's my sigma squared. Okay, so it's just uniform in some sense, minus one half to plus one half. That's not exactly a uniform distribution because it's not a distribution or not a density function, but um, still, this is the I, this is kind of another extreme case that we might consider. All right, so what else can we do? Well, now we're going to move into a slightly different section, not exactly different. We're going to move into the next section, which is about looking at filtering and the ARMA process. Um, and we're going to get another theorem out of this. So it's always a good lecture when you get lots of theorems. Fil fittering, fil where's the L go? The L goes before the T, filtering and the ARMA process. Spelling ability is inversely proportional to uh, the amount of math excitement I have. So <laughs> too much math and I forget how to spell words. Anyway, luckily I have them in front of me here. So consider time series, considering, no, consider XT, a time series with FX omega, the spectral density. Now the question is, can I use the spectral density for X of XT to find a new spectral density for some other process YT? Because like I said, we have these nice theorems here, right? But uh, where's that nice theorem? Here. Where'd Wienerkinchen go? There it is. That's the one I wanted. We have this nice theorem, but ultimately, I don't really know what a spectral density should look like. I know what the auto covariance is. So now I know that if I have the auto covariance, I can use it to get my spectral density, assuming it's absolutely summable. But what else? Is there a better way to do it than to just calculate the auto covariance and shove it into that infinite, doubly infinite sum? And it turns out there is. Because if I have a time series xt, then for some yt, which is equal in this case to the sum j from minus infinity to plus infinity of aj x t minus j, because we always index it going backwards in time, um, this is for some fixed, that is not random, AJs that are absolutely summable, as is often the case with coefficients in this course, right? I need to sum J from minus infinity to plus infinity of the absolute value of the AJ. All right, so the idea is that I could take a process XT and I could find a related process YT by some linear combination, possibly infinite, of the XT. And this is basically like all the ARMA processes we did. XT here could be white noise, right? And the AJ could be coefficients that could give us YT, which would be an ARMA process, hence why this is a ARMA. It's also called filtering because oftentimes you can think of the AJs as a filter being applied to the process XT. So XT here doesn't have to be white noise. That's just a natural thing to think about because we started all our time series with white noise and that's how we get our ARMA process. But XT could be another time series process that we're just applying some type of linear transformation to to get yt like a moving average smoother right and if we want to understand what the spectral density would look like for a moving average smoothed version of xt well we can do that we can apply some uh um, some properties to turn um the spectral density for x into the spectral density for y so how do we do that 
Well, basically, we can consider a to be a function from the integers into the reals, right? Where a that's a of j is just going to be the coefficient aj. All right. And this is called the in blue in pulse in impulse <laughs> not impulse im im pulse response function okay so what else do we need oh i didn't actually finish the uh infinite sum has to be <laughs> the infinite sum of the absolute values of the aj has to be finite for this to make sense um, and beyond the impulse response function, we can also also get its Fourier transform. Which is called, well, I'll write down what it is first. This is going to be capital A of omega. And this is going to be the infinite sum j from minus infinity to plus infinity of a j e to the minus two pi i omega j where here i right is complex number i and j is the index that we're summing over i think the engineers or something i think electrical engineers is it that they like to use j as the imaginary number the square root of minus one uh, it's a mess but uh, yeah, here i is our imaginary number, j is our index. And this is called, what's terminology today? This is called the, well, if the a is the impulse response function and we've just turned it into a omegas and omega is a frequency, we're going to call this the frequency response function. All right. And the question is, why are we defining all of this stuff, right? I always hate it when they define tons of things and you have no idea where we're going with any of this. Well, this is going to lead us into yet another theorem for today. And this one, unlike the wiener kinchin ones, we're actually going to prove um, because it's kind of a short little proof, but I think it helps illustrate what how the auto covariance and the Fourier transform and all of these pieces kind of fit together. Anyway, I should write down what the theorem is before I tell you what we're going to do with it. All right, so once again, let, oops, that is not what I wanted. Once again, let XT be a stationary time series, because otherwise can't work with it. Well, we can, we just need to keep taking differences until it is stationary, I guess. But anyway, with spectral density, f x, little f x, omega. So now we're implying, I guess, implicitly that the auto covariance is summable. Furthermore, I just wrote it above, but to make sure that we are doing a good proper theorem with all the in th pieces included, we'll say let um, a, j, b such that, s, t, such that the sum of what j, from j from minus infinity to infinity of the absolute value of the a, j is finite. Yes. Then the spectral density, the spectral density for, uh, foy, for y 
which yt, I should say, yt, which is going to be the sum j from minus infinity to plus infinity of aj x t minus j, so again, our filtered x process, um, then that is, it, the spectral density for that is, make sure I still have English working here, fy omega, and what we're going to do is simply multiply the absolute value of a omega squared by f x omega. That's really neat. That means that if we want to update our, um, let me circle that in or box that in green. What that means is that if we want to update or figure out what the spectral density is for some new time series process, after filtering x with some coefficients a, then it turns out that it's just take the spectral density for f and multiply by, well, the, ma the squared magnitude of our frequency response function at frequency omega. So cool, let's prove it, and then maybe we can uh, do an example. And that would probably be, yeah, it's probably about good for today. So proof. Well, here what we're going to do is we're just going to compute the auto covariance directly for our process y. Like I said, this whole course is just auto covariance. So KYH is what? Well, it's the covariance, and we're just going to brute force, and we'll write it down exactly as it is in terms of x. So here we're going to get a j from a minus infinity to plus infinity of aj x t, and here we have plus h minus j. And then we also get the same summation, but this time we're not going to have an h in there. We're just going to say aj x t minus j. All right. Well, again, covariance is bilinear, and the aj's are absolutely summable, and xt is a stationary process. So if you believe that I can do this, I'm just going to effectively take the summations out of the covariance. It's always good to be a little skeptical in math, like, can you actually do that? Well, yeah, thanks to the nice conditions on the things in the sum, yes, we can do that. Though we do have to be careful if the things in the sum were not absolutely summable or there were some convergence issues, because then we'd be flipping around a bunch of infinities, and that's never a good time in math. So, oh yeah, I don't want to use i because we need our imaginary number i. So we'll use summation index L from minus infinity to plus infinity. All right, and we're going to be summing aj, al, and we're going to sum kx, h minus j plus l right because what we're doing let's make sure that i got that right when i wrote this down a year ago right what this should be right is the covariance between x t plus h minus j and x t minus l so that's going to be the auto covariance of t plus h minus j minus t plus l. Yep, that looks good because the t's cancel out and the l is positive and the j is negative. So we're all good to go. All right, so now we have a giant double sum of auto covariances. Another good reason why we need that auto covariance to be absolutely summable because we are summing it up a lot. Anyway, um, what are we doing? Well, we're going to replace the auto covariance now with the definition in terms of an integral with respect to the spectral density. That is Wiener Kinchin number two. Um, so we have our sum. I'm not going to write the indices again because they're kind of annoying. So I'm just going to write sum j, sum l. 
and we're going to have the coefficients here and we're going to have our integral from minus one half to plus one half e to the two pi i omega h minus j plus l and then integrated with respect to f omega not f omega fx of omega d omega okay so are we getting anywhere here where now i'm going to once again flip the order of a bunch of limits i'm going to move the summation back in to our integral here and we'll just make sure that that's actually okay yep so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my two sums and I'm going to put them back inside the integral. And what we end up with is the integral of a product of two things. We're going to have the sum, in this case, j, I'll write it out again, minus infinity to plus infinity. And we're going to have the aje to the minus two pi i omega j. Basically, I took this guy, this J, and I put him over here. And then what happens to H and L? Well, what happens to L, I should say? The next thing I get is the sum L from minus infinity to infinity of, well, AL, E to the minus, minus 2 pi I, omega l okay so we got l now all right we're almost there we have one more piece and it's something that we're not summing over it's just the h term e to the 2 pi ah but i wasn't supposed to put a minus sign in there for the l there we go because l has a plus in front of it j has a minus in front of it it doesn't matter because we're summing for all indices from minus infinity to plus infinity but better just to keep it as precise as possible. Anyway, the H is left out here at the end, and then we still have our F, X, omega, D omega. So just to finish my long bit of arrows, we have our H term. So what we're doing is we're just taking the h minus j plus l and we're breaking it into three pieces we're bringing those summations back inside the integral and in some sense undoing the um, double sum that i did before it's kind of funny we needed to do the double sum so we get a bunch of auto covariances replace the auto covariances with the integral with um with respect to the spectral density but then we undo it and we end up with these infinite sums inside the integral okay so what can we do with those well we notice well wait a minute i know what those are those are just i just wrote that down didn't i what is a capital a omega is the sum over all indices of this aj e to the minus 2 pi i omega j well that means that this thing is a omega and this thing is also a omega well is it a omega or is it the complex conjugate of a omega and there i actually was incorrect before that minus sign is important um that's kind of interesting right because you're summing over all the same things hmm, i'll have to think about that but anyway if i can get my uh good we're back Oh no, this thing's going to, uh, nope, good, we're still good. I thought my pen was dying on me. I was a little worried there. I'm like, we're not done with the lecture yet. We still have a little bit more to go, pen. Um, anyway, right, this is the, this is A on the left here as defined up above with the minus two pi i omega j in the exponent. And here we have the complex conjugate. This is because we have a plus sign in the exponent. And when I multiply, well, a complex number by its complex conjugate, what do I get? Well, what I get 
is just the squared absolute or the squared magnitude, the squared absolute value, I guess. Um, in this case, I get, well, I'm going to move this uh, e to the 2 pi i h to the front, omega h, that is. Then I combine these two to get this thing squared. I get, right, when I multiply a complex number by its complex conjugate, I get the squared magnitude. And I still have the spectral density just kind of floating around here. And now it turns out that we are done. So why are we done? We're done because, so we are done because the Fourier transform is unique. which means that if I have something and I take its Fourier transform, I'm gonna get a specific other thing and nothing else can Fourier transform into that other thing except for the thing I started with. That's a weird, confusing sentence, isn't it? Basically, I'll just say the Fourier transform is unique. That's a much better way to say it. Um, and what that means is that, well, where is my... Um, yeah, effectively, that means that, uh, well, we'll use blue. This guy, right, is what? Well, ky at lag h is just going to be the integral from minus one half to one half of e to the two pi i omega h f y omega d omega and basically the point is is that by uniqueness this thing has to be this thing cool and then we're done and we have that we can just quickly update a uh, spectral density by figuring out what the frequency response function is which once again is just a, um, depending on the coefficient aj, is just going to be a sum of a bunch of complex exponentials. Just a sum of complex exponentials. <laughs> All right, so yeah, let's do an example. And we'll save the spectral statistics for the next lecture. All right, so the example is going to be our ARMA PQ process. And the ARMA PQ process will say XT. And what we're going to do is we're going to have the standard set up with capital Phi of B, the autoregressive operator applying to XT, and capital Theta of B, the moving average operator applying to WT. And we're going to rewrite this as what? We're going to rewrite this as XT equal to the, well, the ratio, the fraction here with omega B, or not omega, theta B in the numerator and phi b in the denominator. This is, of course, assuming that phi is invertible or the process is invertible. And we're going to write this. I'm, I'll write that out in a second. We're going to write this as our infinite causal sum, j from 0 to infinity, of psi j omega t minus j. So here we have this is um, causal and this is our causal linear process. All right. But what that means is that we can think of any ARMA, any causal ARMA process as a filtered white noise process. That is, I'm taking my WT and I'm applying some sort of filtering. I'm basically doing like a 
dot product with a bunch of coefficients psi. So here the psi are going to become the a's from above. But let's look at this a little bit closer. All right, so for, all right, let's see if we can do this capital psi of b equal to the ratio, or sorry, I don't want of b, I want z, the complex number. So if I consider capital psi of z, where z is a complex number, and that's going to be the ratio of my two polynomials evaluated at z, Then what do I get? Well, I get, well, <laughs> really just the same thing I had above, but now I'm replacing the white noise pieces with um, Z to the J. So J from zero to infinity of psi J Z to the J. So then what do we get? Well, <laughs> what we get then, therefore, what we have is we have that the, well, I'll write it here. So the um, psi j are like the aj here. Um, so what we have is we have that our frequency response function is going to be what? Well, let's just go look again to make sure we remember what it is. It's the sum of these aj times my complex exponential e to the minus 2 pi i omega j. So what we're going to do is we're just going to rewrite the exact same thing out, but we're going to say j from minus infinity to plus infinity of psi j e to the 2 pi i omega j. But this thing here, these two things are basically the same thing. I mean, I guess I could also start this at uh, zero because all of the size, all of the size for psi being, I guess, with negative indices would be zero. So I could just start this summation at zero. And thus, these two things are the same. So I could actually just write the impulse response function as evaluating the operator psi at 2 to the minus 2 pi, or the polynomial, I guess, i omega, uh, which is equivalent to looking at this ratio of two polynomials, the moving average polynomial at minus 2 pi i omega, and the autoregressive polynomial at e to the minus 2 pi i omega s. So what does this all mean? Well, since f omega, f omega, man, typos everywhere, f x omega is, or not, oh yeah, it's not a typo, that's what I wanted f of, <laughs> the problem is omega and w basically look the same, so I'm going to try to make this explicit, fw of omega being the spectral density for white noise. Now, we already did that in our kind of trivial example up above. We found that it's just sigma squared. So since that's true, then the spectral density for my ARMA process X, my ARMA PQ process X, is just going to be, well, the squared magnitude of this ratio here, evaluated at the complex exponential. Yeah, it's a, uh, this whole thing squared times sigma squared, and thus we have the spectral density for any ARMA PQ process. Neat. 
So that, that's pretty good, right? Uh, it basically means that we can figure out pretty quickly what the spectral density is by just taking the polynomials, which are given to us in our definition of the armor process, and, well, putting a whole bunch of, shoving the, the complex exponential in there and taking the magnitude and squaring it. So, yeah, there's not much else more to say than that. Now, we can get these um, spectral densities and that's going to allow us, again, a different lens to look at our time series. So going forward, we're going to look a little bit more about how to actually do statistics with these um, frequency bits, because so far we've just kind of calculated things for distributions. Um, but again, it is ultimately a stats class, and we're going to want to figure out how to do some statistics with it. All right, and we're back for a really quick bonus part of the lecture, which is going to be some R code looking at a periodic process. We did the periodic process in the last lecture, and I thought it would probably be good to take a moment and actually look to see what the periodic process is doing. So first what we'll do is set C to be 128, a good number, and we'll take T, the span of our process of our time here to be a power of two. It doesn't have to be a power of two. We are going to compute the discrete Fourier transform using the FFT function in R. It's part of the basic stats package. Um, there is an FFT and I'm not sure what MVFFT is. I'll look into that. Um, but regardless, it's going to compute our fast Fourier transform. Um, and I think it can handle Yes, FFT is fastest when the length of the series is being transformed is highly composite. That is, has many factors like two to the two, or two times two times two times two times two nine times. Um, if this is not the case, it may take a long time to compute and use a large amount of memory. So again, this is the idea that we talked about in the last lecture that I probably don't want to solve that big system of equations, but it depends on how powerful your computer is. Luckily, if our time series is something like 512, then the FFT can just crush it really fast using things like that divide and conquer method. Now, I don't know exactly which FFT algorithm is coded in this package, but all I know is it seems to work pretty well. Anyway, uh, what we're going to do is we have our, our time and we have, let's say, the um, well length is just going to be the length and I'm going to create a signal. So I'm going to create it by combining a sine, a cosine, another sine and another cosine. And notice that I have different frequencies in here. I have 32 over the length. I have 16 over the length. I have another 16 over the length and I have a 96 over the length, which is then added. There's a phase in here of plus pi over six. So I can do that. And now I have, well, why don't we just look at what that looks like? So right now there's no randomness. Oh, that's terrible. I don't want that. Okay, that's better. It's kind of uh, crazy looking, um, but that's my nice periodic signal. But we don't want to just stop there. We want to add a little bit of noise to it. So what I'm going to do is I take my signal and I add some random normal noise to every piece. And now if I plot it, well, it looks a little bit like that. Still the same picture. I didn't add a ton of noise to it, just enough to make it, I guess, statistically interesting. Now, what we can do is we can use the FFT function to compute, well, the FFT. And what we're going to do is we are going to scale this FFT by multiplying by two and dividing by the length. Now, as I mentioned in the last lecture, Every FFT kind of has its own normalization going on. Um, and in this case, I think I got this code, I forget. I found this last year. So somewhere I discovered that this is the right way to, uh, I guess, normalize the output of this FFT. Anyway, it doesn't, not really important. The point is that I'm just scaling it by two divided by the length. And then notice that I'm wrapping it in mod, M-O-D. So mod is going to compute the um, modulus, right? Yeah, it's just sort of standard uh, complex numbers and basic functions for complex numbers. It's, it's going to compute the absolute value. It's going to compute the magnitude. And then I'm going to square that. So this is just the squared 
magnitude of the Fourier transform after scaling it a bit. And this is going to be what I call XX p-gram for the periodogram for time series XX. Right, so I think, I, oh, I didn't compute that yet. All right, so I computed it. It runs pretty fast uh, on this laptop. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the frequencies, which are going to be all the possible frequencies zero to length minus one divided by length. And what I can do now is I can plot the periodogram with respect to all of the frequencies, and this is what I get. So here we see a couple big spikes, right? These are the frequencies going from zero to one. Remember, it's symmetric about the point one half. So if I imagine a magical line here at one half, I see the same giant spikes on either side equidistant from the point one half. What I can do is I can um, order the periodogram and find the strongest frequencies in my data. In this case, I can take the top 16 frequencies, though in some sense I only really want the top three because um, they seem to be the most interesting. So now down here in the bottom left corner, what we have are the strongest frequencies in the data. And if we wanted to, we could probably figure out um, what their uh, periodogram is by just taking this thing. And I think I should be able to say sort this. And I think I want decreasing true. And then let's take the first 16 of them. Right, so these are the spikes that I'm seeing. I see a 14.3, a 14.3, a 9.9, .9, a 9.9, .9, then it goes down to 3 and 18 and so on. So these are the uh, the most significant ones. Now, remember, they come in pairs. So I have my 5 and a third frequency, but I also have a uh, 1.23. And that course, the 5 and a third corresponds to this big spike right here, and the one 0.23 corresponds to the big spike on the other side. So in some sense, I actually don't care about every other one of these. I just care about the number that's greater than, um, I guess, two, right? Because if I had a point exactly at one half, it's frequent, the, um, the frequency or the, um, sorry, I'm not computing the frequencies here. I'm computing the um, one divided by the frequency. So this is like the cycle length. I want the frequencies that are less than one half, which would correspond to periods or cycle lengths that are greater than two. So in this case, I would have, um, well, I have my five and a third, I have my 32, and I have my 16, and that's gonna correspond to these first ones. And then after that, the rest of these are all pretty negligible. So there is another, there are more frequencies that come in like 4.2 and, 51.2, but those ones are quite negligible as they correspond to very small values in the periodogram. The top three are, um, well, like I said, five and a third, 32 and 16. So then the question is, well, what are those numbers? Well, if we go back to how we um, generated our periodic process, what we would see here is that I have, well, 32 divided by 512. So let me invert that. If I take 512 and divide by 32, I get a cycle of length oh, 16. Well, that one's here. And if I take 32 and divide by 16, I get a cycle length of oh, 32. Well, that one's also here. And notice that 32 is a stronger signal than 16. And I had a, um, well, a three and a one here versus a two. So I have a slightly stronger signal there, but then the strongest signal seems to be coming from five and a third, which just so happens to be 512 divided by 96. Five and a third. And that's the frequent or the cycle length corresponding to the frequency of 96 divided by 512. So what I'm doing, right, what these spikes are corresponding to is I have three spikes and they're corresponding to the three frequencies that are present in my periodic process. And 
from there, I can get the cycle length because oftentimes we want to know what the period is because that will tell us if we have a seasonal model in our data. So we might have something that's repeating every 16 and 32 um, time steps, whether it's day or month or year, whatever we're doing, or second if we're watching a high frequency process, right? Um, you know, maybe if you have a cycle length of five and a third, that's a little bit harder to deal with because we have discrete time. Um, but it could still happen. Um, oftentimes, if we had a cycle length of five and a third, well, a third is kind of hard because it's not really close to an integer. If we had 5.02, we might just round down to five and say, oh, the cycle length is close to five. If we had 5.9, we might round up to six and say the cycle length is close to six. Five and a third, eh, it's kind of close to one, but... Um, it might just mean that there's also some higher um, frequency in our data. I mean, again, the periodic process is a little different than the time series that we're thinking about when we want to know how frequently something or how what the period is for a seasonal model. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, there's one more thing I have. Well, there's, I think, two more things I have here. But yeah, we're not going to do the ANOVA bit yet. That's for the next lecture. But what we will do is we can add some more noise and see what happens. So if I do this entire thing again, but I just add on a ton of Gaussian white noise, then what happens? Well, what we get is we still get some strong signals, but we also have some erroneous ones in here. So if I go back and I... Ah, we'll just do it like that. If I go back and I try to compute the um, strongest frequencies in my data, I get some other things going on. So I still get my 32, that's good. I still get my five and a third. They've switched positions, but they're both still strong. And I still get my 16. So great, I actually got my three signals. But I also got some other weird ones. Like I have an 18 and 0.28. Uh, I have an infinity because that's zero, divide, one divided by zero, right? Because I'm looking at these as cycle lengths, not as frequencies. If we go back to our periodogram that I sorted up above, we can look at the values and they seem to decrease like 10, 10, and 5. But then I also get some that are like 3 and 2.7 and 2.5. So then the question is to identify that which ones of these are actually significant in the data, which ones are not. And we're going to look a little bit more at this in the context of ANOVA, but we haven't discussed that exactly yet. So we're going to save that for a little bit later, maybe in the next lecture. But for now, I just want to show you what you might see, right? You have a signal here. It looks pretty noisy. It's not clear that there's any periodicity in here. But after hitting it with the FFT and getting my periodogram, I can identify that, yeah, there are some pretty strong periodic signals in our um, frequencies, that is, that show up in this noisy data which is great because this is kind of like, uh, you know, if you have a radio wave over a noisy channel, right, and you want to pick out the certain frequencies that are being sent. Um, anyway, that's more or less all I wanted to say. It's just a little bit of a uh, bonus note. So, yeah, back to the lecture notes. All right, so that more or less wraps up what I wanted to talk today about uh, with respect to the spectral distribution and the spectral density. So why did we spend a whole lecture talking about this. Well, ultimately, right, we have time series. It's a signal in time. We want to be able to look at it in the frequency domain and trying to look at the spectral density, if it exists, hopefully it does, will give us a new way to look at a time series process, right? Because as I mentioned before, you can think of the spectral density as a decomposition of the variance of the process into contributions from different frequencies. So if there are some strong frequencies in the um, in a process, like in the periodic process, which yes, is not stationary, but we can still look at the spectral distribution function and notice that if we were to imagine what the spectral density would look like, it would look like kind of a two big spikes, right, that just kind of shot up at the um, frequency of interest. 
in contrast, if we have white noise, we have a flat line. And this gets back to something that I mentioned way back at the start of the course, that white noise, why is it white, right? Why is it called white noise? Well, in a sense, it has all of the frequencies equally represented inside it. It is sort of perfectly random and chaotic. And that's exactly what we have here with the spectral density being flat. It's kind of saying that every frequency has its equal contribution. And what we can do now is we can identify what the spectral distribution should look like for different time series processes. And if we have data, right, because again, it's a stats class. If we're going to actually have data, what we can do is we can estimate the auto covariance. So we can we can compute it directly this way. But if we estimate where in the world did that theorem go, I know it's here somewhere. Come on, Wiener Kinchin. There you are. That's what I wanted. Because ultimately, if we have an estimate of the auto covariance function, what we can do is we can, well, Fourier transform it and we can get out a spectral density and we can learn a lot from that spectral density. So, with that, I have a couple more things to mention. One is uh, I did. Decide to double check just because this is going online. I want to make sure I get everyone's name correct. We have uh, Norbert Wiener, who was around for the first half about of the 20th century, American mathematician. Uh, looks like he was born in Missouri, so I was right there. And then we have Alexander Kinchin, uh, who is a Soviet mathematician born in Kondrovo, Russian Empire. I guess he was born prior to the Soviet Union, but he did die in the Soviet Union in the around the same time, actually, as uh, Norbert Wiener just a few years before. Um, so presumably they never actually worked together on that theorem, but uh, yeah. Oh, and lastly, I double checked uh, Stilches uh, for the Riemann Stilches integral. Uh, yeah, he was a Dutch mathematician. That's one I actually just didn't know about, uh, to be honest, which I feel bad because I've used his integral so many times uh, from the 19th century. He died around, well, around the same time that uh, Kinchin and Wiener were born. Um, and lastly, we have a Brownian motion, which is an equivalent way of referring to the Wiener process. Uh, but uh, it's uh, Brownian motion named after Robert Brown who was a Scottish botanist. Uh, so I should be a little careful there. I think earlier in my talk, I said possibly British, and that's a big faux pas. So sorry about that one. Scottish botanist uh, and gets the name Brownie Emotion comes from him. So there's a couple little fun facts for the end of the lecture, because why not? You know, it's always good to know where all these names are coming from. But more importantly, time series. What we'll be doing now going forward is looking a little bit more at spectral statistics, right? Because so far we've done a lot of stuff with the spectral um, in the spectral domain, but we haven't really done any statistics yet. And that's what we have to do next, because it is, after all, statistics course, time series analysis. And I'll see you in the next lecture.